So how to self-care, how to take care of ourselves during the trauma. Self-awareness, understanding what's happening inside of your brain will hopefully yield you to a greater sense of compassion as to what's happening when it's hard to breathe, what's happening when it's hard to fall asleep. Why are you so tired? Why are you so burned out? Why are you bored? Why are we a little bit more snippy than we usually would be? What happened to the calm me? Well, we're in a pandemic. <laughs> Give yourself a little bit of the permission to be human. And we need to self-care. We need some strategies for how to work with, our, with, with what we're experiencing. And the most important thing that I want to share is what I just said before about our emotional brain versus our rational brain. It is our emotional brain or what we would call our unconscious brain rather than our conscious brain that is doing this whole stress response, that is reacting to trauma. That fight, flight, freeze response that's present within us is present within lizards and it is present within foxes because it is our core brain that is reacting when we're angry, when we're afraid, when we're guilty, when we're, when we're worried. It is our emotional brain that is making us have even more complex emotions like guilt. And the, the break, major breakthroughs that have come in the field of trauma care have actually come through the integration of brain, mind, and body. A really powerful book um, that I highly recommend if you're interested in more of an understanding of the, the case studies of this is The, um, the Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And since then, this book has been published, I think over a decade ago, we now have many, many more uh, uh, modalities than the ones that they even talked about. And the key is that you can't remove by reason that which was not put there by reason in the first place. So you can't talk your way to calming down when you've been traumatized by the things that you've heard. When I was working with um, Harry Pickens, a uh, energy psychology practitioner who uses everything from havening to EFT to other modalities and how he works with his clients, my I got to my my father. I found out that my father. Uh, had gone out and was showing symptoms on a Thursday. I was upstate New York. I got to him by Friday. He passed away on Monday evening. And I sent a message to Harry on Sunday going, hey, Harry, do you have time for a session tomorrow? I know I'm going to need some support. At that point, I didn't know that my father was going to be gone within 24 hours. But I knew that at this point, his body was shutting down and it wasn't going to be fighting any longer. I, I got the, the doctor told me that and I was sort of like preparing myself for that because once he got, I was able to put him on oxycodone, like his body just sort of started to just slowly begin the dying process, whereas before it was like still fighting for it. And I knew that I needed to work with the coding of his gasping for breath because I could hear his voice. I, you know, I would be sleeping with like one ear open because I would be sleep. I would be laying there trying to sleep, but he, because he was gasping, his mouth was getting really dry. And so every couple of hours he would call me and ask me to bring him water. So he'd call for me. And so like, I had this like hyper response to my hearing to the <sighs> sound of him gasping. And so I was like, I need to haven this. And, and even by the time I got to my session to do it with, with Harry, I had to actually um, work on not that because I was havening myself and doing all these body techniques. And so that actually wasn't triggering an emotional response with me, within me. It was actually an emotional response to a family member that yelled at me for t not taking my dad to the hospital because I knew that my father would have wanted to die at home. And I knew if I called 911, he would have to be alone and I wouldn't be by his side. And a family member yelled at me. She's like, he can't make that decision. You need to make that decision. And so literally what we did was we did tapping on my feeling of uh, frustration. But the key is I used my body. I didn't, I knew I wasn't going to talk my way out of hearing the loop of my, my father's gasping for breath in my, in, in my body. It is my senses. It is my body that is coding this into my amygdala. And that's why we know that the psychosensory therapies are some of the most effective ways of treating trauma. And I believe they're the most effective 
strategies for preventing the trauma from being coded as trauma in real time. If you can catch yourself, if you can catch that gauge of your emotional response being lifted up, you can dial it back down. So there's two different groups of what we would call psychosensory techniques that uh, that, that uh, in particular Havening has outlined. Havening, EFT, something called CT and TFT, Callahan techniques or thought field therapy. Some of you might've heard of EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, and even acupuncture are modalities that are psychosensory. They use the body, the senses to access the brain. Non, and, and the reason we call them specific is because they can be targeted. You can target a memory and actually call up that memory and apply the medicine to the neurons that are being fired through these, some of these different approaches. So I'm gonna show you some of the basic self-care ones that you can use in these modalities. And there, there's so much available on the internet as to where you can research these further for yourself. The non-specific ones are ones that you're not necessarily going to be targeting a memory you know, very rarely are you like, oh my God, I'm so upset. I'm so emotional. Let me strike a lunge pose and I'm going to like clear my trauma. For most of us, it's like you're going through the yoga practice and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a hip opener and you're just crying. And you don't even know what you're crying about. It could be a memory. They're non-specific, but they're use of the body to target the, the mind. And before I came to positive psychology, when I had discovered psychology for a short period of time, I was actually as an undergraduate student um, majoring in art therapy because I became really passionate about the prospects of creative arts as therapy more than just regular talk therapy. And thank God I found positive psychology and, and now mind body approach. And the key is that trauma is coded in the emotional brain. You the, the reason that um, the creative arts can be so therapeutic and oftentimes as effective, if not more effective than just, just traditional therapy alone, mind you guys, I'm not knocking traditional therapy, right? There's a place for all of it. It's just, we need different techniques. And the creative arts is therapy, dance therapy, music therapy, art therapy. The reason they're so therapeutic is because they work with the nonverbal brain. Images work with the nonverbal brain. Movement works with the nonverbal brain. Music works with the nonverbal brain. Aromatherapy, massage, exercise, and all related activities are working with the body. Biofeedback, neurofeedback, yoga. These are nonspecific techniques that I put under the umbrella of self-care practices that help us digest and process our emotions because emotions are not problematic. Emotions are only problematic when we don't know how to move them through our body. So when people would sort of be like, Amelia, are you sure you're okay? You know, how are you doing? And I literally, I'll tell them like, I'm doing well. I feel the grief when it comes up. I cry when I need to cry. Usually I can't, I, get, I haven't been able to cry. I, don't, I haven't timed it, but I really don't think I've had any se crying session that's been longer than like 90 seconds to two minutes, you know? Cause when you really let yourself fully feel it doesn't get coded in the body. I can tell you the exact moment, the, the minute that my, my, bro, my, my father died, not when my brother died, but I, I can still remember where I was when I got the news that my brother had died. But my father took his last breath. I took a breath with him. It was the quietest, most peaceful moment I've ever experienced. And then I just took a breath in and it was 9.45 at night and I wailed. I don't think I've ever really truly wailed like this before because when my brother died and I found that news out, I didn't want to scream too loud because I didn't want to upset my parents and my mom and dad. And like, I cried, but it wasn't like the full on wail. I didn't fucking give a shit who heard me or what heard me. And it just went out and it just moved through me. Most of us, we don't know how, we're not, we haven't been taught how to work our emotions, how to move our emotions. We've been told, um, I run, I come from a Russian culture where we, um, you, uh, I'll, I'll pause and I'll go back to this. I'll tell you guys a quick story. Um, even just back on uh, the last, uh, my, my last birthday, I had my father, his his life, his new life partner, his girlfriend, and my uh, a dear friend of mine over, and we were celebrating my birthday in December. And my friend had said something uh, to my dad, saying, "Tell me something about Alex. Alex is my brother who passed away." And um, and and 
and it was just this, this beautiful thing where I really got to feel that because of my Russian culture, my family, we don't do emotions well. My, my family never knew what to do with emotions. I can still remember being in the hospital with my mom and the nurse kind of coming in and sort of saying like, or it was the, the doctor had just come in and just said that my mother's creatinine levels were so high. She's like, I don't even know how you're having a conversation right now. And, and I just kind of knew that in that moment, my mother understood that the cancer was getting the best of her and she wasn't going to start, she wasn't going to fight anymore. And I started crying and my mom was telling me not to cry. I need to stop crying. And I'm like, mom, this is sad. This is cry worthy, right? I'm losing you. And, and she just didn't know how to cry. And there, my friend was asking my, my, my dad to share something about my brother. And it was this touching moment where my dad got kind of emotional because again, even though at that point, 20 years had passed, since my brother had passed away, my father was never given the skills as to how to feel. Like, thank God I've been given the, the capacity to study emotions and study the brain and know how to move them. And I had this fascinating cultural moment in that moment. So my friend asks about my brother, my dad gets emotional, I start crying. And my dad's girlfriend, who's also Ukrainian, she goes, Ninada, Ninada. Ninada in Russian means not necessary not necessary. And I, in my head went, whoa, my neurons in my brain made the connection. How fascinating. I was raised in a culture that said not necessary when we felt. No wonder my mother got sick. She didn't know how to feel her emotions, how to move them through them. My father, you know, I have seen my father cry a handful of times about my mother and about my brother, but nobody ever gave him the tools. One of the reasons I can talk to you guys, I can share these skills is because I know that emotions, all emotions are human. All emotions are necessary. Emotions are only a problem when it gets stuck in our body, because when you get stuck in sadness, it becomes depression. When you get stuck in anger, it becomes rage. When you get stuck in worry, it becomes anxiety. We have a right to be worried about what is happening in our world today. But if you over worry, you're going to be at risk for anxiety and it's going to take away from your life. It's going to be life diminishing. But if you just really let yourself feel the worry of, I don't know what's going to happen, really feel it, it doesn't last very long. When I'm really grieving the loss of my father, I can't seem to cry for more than 90 seconds to two minutes. I would love to be able to have like a really good belly cry. And I think it will most likely happen as like something I'll probably start cracking up laughing at something. And then I will start hysterically crying as a result of it. But it's like, I wish I could get more of it out. When you fully feel it, I believe that there's a wisdom to our heart that when we are experiencing grief in particular, that our heart knows that we can't feel, we can't let ourselves feel it all at once because literally we would die of a heartbreak. And there's actually a word, a condition, I think it's in the Japanese culture that they actually have a word for death of a broken heart. So our heart has a wisdom to it and it kind of lets it out, kind of lets, lets out some of the sadness as we're ready, little bits at a time. So we have to create the container that we let ourselves feel. So when people say to me, Amelia, are you sure you're okay? And I go, yeah, I, I, I am. I'm, I'm reaching out for help when I need it. And I know that I need a lot of dance right now. I need a lot of unstructured time where I'm just breathing and I'm just allowing my body to move because it is through the moving and the undulation of the energy of my body that I can get my emotions moving. Energy in motion. I see that there's some people typing in the chat box around breath work. Yes, thank you, Dr. T. Pro. Taco Subo, cardiomyopathy, death of a broken heart. Our heart has a wisdom. Oftentimes people swallow their emotions, they swallow their tears, they hold it inside. Well, it's gotta go somewhere. The body keeps the score. So self-care through any of these modalities, just moving, going for a walk, breathing, breath work, imagery work, are all of these simple skills and tools. And people who are in our Better Than Before program know that we're doing these exercises as little exercises throughout the week. I'm teaching basic breathing exercises. We're doing basic positive psychology skills, knowing that this is a practice. This is a practice. And so the more we train ourselves in just being able to feel our emotions and move them through us, the more resilient we are going to be. And turning to these psychosensory therapies, understanding that you can't reason your way out of trauma. You have to use your body. I cannot wait to get a full body massage. 
the stress chemicals get, they go into our tissues, right? They get released. We have to exercise our way out of these things. So I wanna show you a video from the uh, people who have created havening technique to have to give you an explanation of one of the hypotheses. So I will tell you that I have been using psychosensory therapy such as havening, such as tapping, such as um, just things that cross the midline of the body, these very simple strategies. I, I bring them into my coaching practice. I use them in myself. I, I teach them to my students all the time. And I know that this technique is incredibly powerful. It works within minutes. We're not even talking days, we're talking minutes. And we're still early on to understanding what is the actual neurobiology about how it works. And the reason that we are still kind of early on to it is because we can traumatize a rat, but you can't do um, you you can you can't do something like havening to a rat, and the reason for it is because one of the ways that havening works is that you you should you have to recall you have to be aware of the fact that you feel a stressful stimuli, or you feel the emotion rise in your body, and then you apply havening touch, or you recall a stressful situation, and you calm the body down. So we know that there is just the role of calming down, and that is very present within within rats and with other animals. That if you induce stress through petting, through oxytocin, and through serotonin and some of these other calming down chemicals, you can relax the stress response. But in terms of targeting specifically the, neuro, the neuronal receptors where the trauma is, um, is coordinated, you can't say to a rat, okay, rat, recall a time where somebody hung you upside down by your tail, and now let me pet you while you count backwards by 10, right? Like, we can't do that, but that is how havening works. So until we can't do deep, like so it's very expensive to do deep brain stimulation. And so we are not doing, uh, there hasn't been any study I've seen thus far that has proven that this is what's happening on the brain. But I do trust that there's some very educated scientists that are using and combining different research papers on how we know that emotions and memories get coded and recoded that I think are pointing us in the right direction of how, um, of how we are able to recode a stressful stimuli. So I don't, um, I'm gonna give you guys, I'm gonna fast forward this a little bit because part of what you're about to see here, I've already walked us through in terms of what is a trauma. So we know that we need a resilient landscape and when we have a resilient landscape, we are less vulnerable to stress and that when our landscape is vulnerable, then we want to be on the lookout for understanding what is happening that is that leads to um, post-traumatic stress. And these things can actually lead to being more at risk for having a vulnerable landscape, having low mood, having depression, having had a history of other traumatic events, living in fear, being angry, um, not knowing how to uh, take care of yourself. So this is, um, I'm going to just pick this up here and um, we will see how the we do. creation of a traumatic memory. This is a creation of a traumatic we memory. Normally restore memories. The sensory information that we're experiencing in the moment in that event comes through our neurology, through all of our senses, into what is known as the thalamus in our brain. Thalamus then passes a certain amount of the information directly onto the amygdala. It is this amygdala that is responsible for detecting immediately whether we are at threat or in a non-threatening situation. If what we're perceiving to be going on is non-threatening, then we just store certain elements of this information as a normal memory. So, what's different in traumatization? Let's look at the components now. So 
We have the event itself, there has to be a particular event or an experience that occurs. And as we are talking about with the amygdala before, if the amygdala perceives with the information it has available that we are at threat, and our landscape is already vulnerable, there is one other component that needs to be present in order for us to store things traumatically. And this is a perceived sense of inescapability. What we mean by this is something that is occurring as an event by which we feel as though we have no means to escape. This doesn't have to be a literal escape. There are many situations in life that we perceive that we just have no way out of, where we are stuck, helpless, out of control and at the mercy of others. Or in the moment we perceive that we can't do anything to get ourselves out of it. more obvious situations where we are literally unable to escape. Sorry, one second. It feels like it was perceiving it thing. to be threatening. There we go. We have an event or a series of experiences collectively and a strong emotional response to it because we're being threatened. So, how does this occur within the brain? Let's revisit the amygdala where all of this occurs. Claudia, did you already hear this? I can't, I didn't remember how far along we were. No, we're right where we were, okay, thank you. Ah. It did freeze, which I'm glad that I got it. All of the information is coming in through all of our senses through the thalamus and into the amygdala where it's carried through a series of nerves known as neurons. And these neurons form a pathway from one neuron to the next, to the next and so on. Between each neuron there's a gap that the information has to jump across. This information is in the form of an electrical chemical pathway. In other words, it's a form of electrical waves and chemicals. At the end of each neuron, we have what is known as a presynaptic neuron. The synapse being the gap that this information has to jump across. So the information gets to the pre-synapse and is transported as chemicals across to what is known as the post-synaptic neuron, the neuron on the other side of the gap. It is on the surface of this post-synaptic neuron that there are receptors ready to receive these chemicals to transmit the information through down into that neuron and onwards. There is a particular type of receptor on the postsynaptic surface of the neurons in the amygdala that is responsible for this traumatic encoding. When information through this signal, including the emotion producing stimulus from the event itself, gets to this synapse, chemicals which excite and activate a particular type of receptor are released from it and they activate what is known as an AMPA receptor on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron. A particular protein enzyme is also released, which is called the PKM zeta-like enzyme. And this enzyme permanently binds this AMPA receptor to the surface of the neuron. In other words, locking this receptor in place. What this receptor can then enable is each time we experience a trigger, it can pass that signal straight through the receptor all the way to the emotional response. This allows a direct and extremely strong link and connected pathway to the emotional content. From this moment on, whenever something triggers it that is remotely similar to the initial event, 
not necessarily logically, but just perceived in that way by our unconscious mind, the pathway fires off and generates the same emotional response, the associated behaviors that come about off the back of that, and releases the stress hormones in response to this event. For example, say we were unfortunate enough to get bitten by a dog and we had a vulnerable landscape and we perceived that to be threatening to our lives and we couldn't get out of it because the dog was coming at us and we had no way to get out of the park or wherever it occurred. The next time we see a dog or a park or even the shadow that could look like a dog or anything that reminds us of that particular initial event, the trigger gets fired off. It zips through that pathway straight to our emotional response of say intense fear and panic. This receptor that's responsible for transmitting this signal stays permanently anchored onto the surface of this neuron ready to get activated whenever something signals to it. We experience a trigger to transmit this through to the emotional response. However, and this is where finally havening comes in, the havening can disrupt this pathway, permanently delinking the trigger from that response. So what is havening? Simply put, havening is using applied touch to accessible parts of our body in order to alter our brain chemistry. It is this altered chemistry that gives us a way in to be able to biologically change the way that our memories have been stored. The Rudin brothers, who created Havening after years of research, have found a way to literally delink the emotional content of a memory from the memory itself, therefore meaning that the memory is no longer traumatic. Because of the way the Havening Touch alters our brain chemistry, it's not just about traumatic memories. It has multiple uses, as it creates a calm state and creates chemical changes that enable its use in depression, anxiety, as well as being used over the longer term to get the amygdala, which we've spoken so much about, over time to literally stand down and stop detecting threat, which is what is going on in anxiety. It also, when used over a longer period of time, alters that landscape of our brain, starts building it up to make it stronger and more resilient, biologically changing and altering the state of our brain. Due to the state that it evokes within us through the havening touch, it can also be used extremely powerfully to do the equivalent of installing suggestions to ourselves, exploring beliefs that we have or that we want to have, as well as outcomes and goals that we have for ourselves in a very intense and compelling way. But for now, for this particular video, we are going to look at what the havening does for these events that we've been speaking so much about and how it helps de-traumatize them and remove that emotional response. So in what is known as event havening, we initially and extremely briefly have to activate that neurology and get that AMPA receptor that we were talking about activated, ready to transmit that signal. To do that, we need to really briefly ensure that the memory of the event is recalled. Beyond that, we start going immediately into distraction techniques and start applying the sensory input as havening touch. The touch is gentle, calm movements repetitively done onto our shoulders and upper arms, our palms or across our cheeks. Very quickly, this touch produces a form of an electrical wave, which is known as the delta wave. This delta wave is the same as what we produce when we're in slow wave sleep, the deepest form of sleep that we can go in. This delta wave changes the state of our brain and it alters the chemical and electrical balance of it. 
The touch in the delta wave increases our level of serotonin surging around in our system and decreases cortisol, which decreases our stress levels. All of this leads to a very calm state. That delta wave travels through and gets to the postsynaptic neuron automatically. And as it does so, it opens up what is known as the calcium channels, a channel which lets calcium directly into the postsynaptic neuron. This calcium activates a particular protein enzyme called calcineuron. This calcineurum effectively dissolves the other enzyme that was holding this amper receptor active and activated, what is known as potentiated, on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron. By dissolving the enzyme that was locking this amper receptor in place, the amper receptor is allowed to internalize And therefore, the signal from a particular trigger has no way to link it to the emotional content anymore. The path is permanently disrupted, meaning that if the trigger occurs, it delinks that from the emotional response. No emotional response to a memory means that it is no longer traumatic, it is just a memory. So there you have it. Havening Touch can alter memories, change our landscape, and make it far more resilient. So although we are always our history, we do not need to be defined by it. have it <laughs> simple <laughs> just kidding this is like what i want to be like do 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 do, do. just kidding um <clears throat> so that is um dr rudens uh who has spent a lot of time as a medical doctor trying to understand what are the mechanisms behind how some of these other psychosensory therapy techniques worked and then trying to understand how these therapies worked and looking at the literature on how trauma was encoded and decoded in the brain, he came up with this concept of um, havening to basically accelerate some of that process by using our largest sensory organ. If you're interested in learning more about it, check out the Havening, in, uh, the havening Techniques Institute. Um, I really recommend this book. I have it right here with me, When the Past is Always Present, a really great one to go along with The, um, the Body Keeps the Score. And the Dr. Rudin um, has created the concept of electroceuticals. He basically talks about how our um, <clears throat> how the use of our our self how we can use our sensory organs, which would create an electrical impulse through the uh, through touch or some of these tapping techniques that are producing electrical impulses or any kind of movement which creates an electrical impulse, such as when we put a defibrillator on, we're trying to use boom, shock to use that electric wave to jumpstart an organ or when we put an electrical response to make a muscle twitch. He, um, has, he understands that our body takes that electrical impulse and then creates a chemical impulse as a result of it. And he calls them electroceuticals, that just like pharmaceuticals that we would take in order to impact the different chemicals that are being released in our brain, we can actually create our own electroceuticals and that the way that these psychosensory therapies work is that they're working on the electrical impulses. So when you see light therapy, for example, light therapy is taking those electric waves and converting them through the receptors in our eyes 
and turning that electrical impulse into a chemical impulse, which then gets carried out inside of our brain. And so what they're offering to us is this idea that we can become our own pharmacologist if we know how to use our body accordingly. Claudia is already tapping herself, which is awesome, right? How fascinating that through these very simple practices, I could actually release chemicals in our brain, chemicals in my brain. I can release my own adrenaline or noradrenaline by thinking about shit that pisses me off. If I was like, oh, I really could use a little cortisol right now, I can, I can choose to go turn on something that's stressful to watch and I could do it. If I, um, I, we can actually create our own chemicals inside of our brain. Our brain will also naturally release dopamine as well. We can actually impact our, our motivation centers if you know how to, how to um, trigger that chemical with, within our brain. But my, I can also look at something really yummy. I know that my body's gonna go, ooh, I want that, and that's gonna release dopamine. Um, gamma, ga um, GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, is one of the ones that I think is really, really beautiful because it is our calming neurotransmitter. So it's this neurotransmitter right over here that, that we're working with. So to know that when we are doing things that are soothing, when we are calming ourselves now down, it is the GABA that is being released in our brain. And the way that I explain it to my clients when I'm using psychosensory te techniques, when I'm working with them, is I explain to them that when they get stressed out, there's excitatory chemicals being released in their body. The adrenaline, the noradrenaline, the glutamate, that is the glutamate is forming the memories, the adrenaline and the noradrenaline are getting them pumped up, getting them stressed out. And when we have an excitatory chemical being released, and at the same time, we then release the GABA, the calming, the relaxation response, it negates it on out. And I literally have had the most profound experiences with my clients where they've had decade old traumas melt away in just minutes by using these techniques. And what's really amazing is if you just look for an EFT practitioner, or you look for a havening practitioner, if you have been pre-exposed to traumatic events. And the way that I would describe a trauma is um, the way that the Center for Mind-Body Medicine defines a trauma. They define a trauma as something that can still cause a strong emotional response within you more than four months after the event has happened. So it is normal for, for me to feel very high levels of emotion over something in the short term. There's no exact way that um, there, there's no uh, there's no exact way to to say oh this is an appropriate amount of time to feel emotion but if you are still going to on a scale of zero to ten which we call a sud a subjective unit of distress if in a memory still triggers you to a six a seven or an eight ten years later that was traumatic and it could be that your teacher told you you were stupid it could be that you got bullied at school. It could be that something happened to your sibling that you had a witness. Those are things that still make our, our landscape a little bit more vulnerable. And so seek out practitioners that actually have the right skill to do that. I've worked with people who have told me, you know, I've been, I've been in therapy. I've talked through my sexual trauma. I've talked about these things. It hasn't helped them much more that then they can talk to me and tell me what's happening but then they find themselves in an intimate connection with a partner that their neocortex says, my partner is safe, they love me, I'm in an okay place, nothing bad is gonna happen, and they're just in pure terror and fear. And that's because you can't remove by reason that which was not put there by reason in the first place. So if you're in the category of what I would call the second one of what I was promising you you'd get out of this session, which is that if you have pre-existing conditions where you are either very vulnerable to stress, where you've been through traumatic life events, know that there we now have tools for actually accessing and working with the limbic system. You can access those tools on your own. You don't need a practitioner. Start to dance, start to move your body, start to feel your emotions, start to make sound. I was talking about this earlier when I was talking about feeling our feelings. We live in a culture where we don't, we don't really get our voices out anymore. It used to be just a few hundred years ago that the entertainment in your community was you would gather together in your church or in your choirs with, with, with family around a piano. People would sing together, people would make sounds, and we would actually get our voices out. 
very rarely do we create appropriate places for us to move emotions. Sound is a powerful way to move emotion. Breath is a powerful way to move emotion. Movement is a powerful way to move emotion. And most of us, we kind of like are a little bit of a tight ass. We, we, we don't let ourselves feel these things, but we are animals. You and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals. So if something makes you angry, if something gets in your face, scream. If you're seeing something on TV that it is appropriate, you could literally say, okay, kids, I promise you, I'm going to be fine. I just need to go into my bedroom and I'm just going to scream into a pillow because these, the, the politics of the situation are making me really angry. I'm going to go scream. I'll feel better in a couple of minutes. Your kids aren't going to get traumatized. They're going to go, oh, that's a weird thing that mom does where she like goes and she puts, screams into a pillow. She comes out, she's happier. She feels better. Emotions, when we don't know how to work with them, they become a problem because they become reflexive. But when you're in control of your emotions and you know that there is a difference between experiencing your anger than expressing your anger. I'm not about expression as much as I am about experiencing. My experiencing my anger is my ability to digest my anger. If I just lash out and I scream at people, I'm expressing anger. And part of the problem is that most people have seen healthy expressions of emotions. And so all you've seen is when they've been out of control. It took me so many years to learn how to love my anger. Because as a woman, I didn't feel comfortable or safe to have anger or experience anger. And situations that should have made, you, made me angry when people were violating my rights made me want to cry. And I literally had to go, how fascinating. I should be angry, but it just makes me cry. Like, I don't feel, com I had to literally learn how to roar. I had to learn to be okay with the Kali energy in me. If those of you who are yogis in there and, and like to follow the, the Hindu uh, uh, philosophies of the, the deities, Kali is one of the female gods. She is the one that fights and will kill for her babies. And she is nature and she's the destroyer. And she's like, ah, and she's portrayed with her tongue sticking out and she has all these weapons. And she is one of the elements of feminine energy. And so I had to really learn to love my anger, but I digress. So if you have things that in your past still dial you up, self-care for yourself. Know that there are strategies. You are not going to, you do not need to be defined by your circumstances and know that you can turn up your own pharmacology. One that's not on here. That's a really important one is oxytocin. We all need to be working our oxytocin response. Oxytocin is the bonding chemical. Oxytocin is what tells our body, I am safe. It is the chemical that is related to the concept of trust. And when we feel safe, when we feel like we are okay, we are, we release oxytocin and it gets, it comes out when we feel connected. So it comes during massage, it comes through lovemaking, it comes out in our bodies. When moms are breastfeeding, it gets released within the baby as well. Well, it gets released when we pray. It gets released anytime that we feel like we are connected to something bigger than ourselves. And this is why it's so important for us to say, I can socially distance, but I do not need to isolate. And it's so important for people to keep remembering that they are connected. They are a part of something bigger than themselves. The reason I'm so passionate about running this Better Than Before program is because I feel that we that that part of the thing that is most needed is that we have to stay connected to one another. We have to know that we're not alone. And so when I bring people onto the line, what I'm also looking to give them is little daily inoculations of um, of of giving them little in, in uh, injections of oxytocin. Right, you're not alone. We're all in this together because that fires up those chemicals within our body. We can allow ourselves to release our endorphin pathways. So over here, we have endorphins. Endorphins are things that make us feel good. And why not? Sometimes we feel guilty. I'm in a pandemic. I'm in the middle of a pandemic. Should, should I feel good? <laughs> Who am I to like enjoy or luxuriate in my free time if I'm in the middle of a pandemic? I had to deal with my own guilt for the fact that I chose to leave New York City. 
for my friends, uh, my friend who my, a bunch of my friends who live out of New York, out of New York, they're calling me to their place. They're saying, Amelia, come quarantine in Asheville. Amelia, come quarantine in Pittsburgh. Amelia, come quarantine in all these different places. And I was like, Nah, I'm a New Yorker. I'm hardy. I can take it. I can stay in my apartment. I can't even go to my office, which is just a few blocks away. It's okay. I can stay in my apartment. I love my apartment. And then I had a reality hit, which I was like, you know what? No, like I stand for well-being, and if I have the option to go somewhere that I can actually get outside and be in nature, I knew that I was gonna be better able to serve the people who are, I would be able to run workshops like this because I would have energy available to myself to be able to, um, to, to do these things. So I had to drop my own guilt and actually let myself feel endorphins, feel good from actually going outside. So when I, when I, I rented an Airbnb in upstate New York and, I knew that part of my self-care was to actually not just go outside, but really let it in, let myself actually feel it was going to be such an important part of it. And so often it's not that actually feeling happy is all that difficult. Feeling happy is simple, feeling grateful. There's so much that we can find to be grateful for. Um, it's just a matter of letting ourselves do it, actually letting ourselves go there. And so this, the strategies are simple. It's the permission, the permission to do it. All right, friends, we're almost there. You guys are such troopers. Thank you, those of you who are, are hanging in there with me. Thank you for your attention. Again, I just, I really want to get this level of detail of information out there. It'll be available on YouTube. People will be able to um, go in and, and watch this for, for times to come. So know that by being my very live and receptive audience, you are helping me also uh, be able to do this because it would just wouldn't be as fun without such a receptive audience. Um, and so before we go to the other techniques, I also want to share with you this concept of the, um, of the importance, like research tells us that we know that positive emotions are incredibly, incredibly important to us. Uh, research by Dr. Barbara Fredrickson talks about the importance of positive emotions because firstly, positive emotions boost our immune system, that you literally can, can measure people's socialness and how happy they are. And when they're in a positive emotional space, they actually have more killer cells, more T cells available in their body to fight off disease when positive emotions are present. Dr. Barbara Fredrickson's lab has also cultivated what we know as the broaden and build theory of positive emotions, that positive emotions narrow our focus, positive emotions broaden us, they broaden our resourcefulness. And one of the most important parts of that broaden and build theory is the undoing hypothesis of positive emotions. So positive emotions actually help undo the harmful effects of stress. And so they would conduct a research study that would look like this. They would have people go through an anxiety provoking situation. One way that you in a lab can give people an anxiety provoking situation is you bring them into a lab and you say, here, you have three minutes to memorize, you have like however many, 15 minutes to memorize this script, and then you have to go perform it in front of people who are going to judge you and evaluate your performance. And then when they go and they have this stressful situation, if that couldn't be more stressful, because for many people, fear of public speaking is something that is high and stressful, the person who's witnessing their performance gives them a complete dead stare, like no emotion the whole time. And this, actually fires up our stress response in our nervous system. And so they have an anxiety provoking situation and then they put them through one of four conditions. So the four conditions look like this. The first group watches a funny or amusing uh, show, something that's meant to make them laugh. And they then look at how long does it take them to recover? The second condition watches something that's meant to make them feel content. The third condition was a no emotion control group and the other condition watched something sad. And the question was, how long would it take them to recover? And what they found was that the recovering back to baseline was fastest. The undoing of the stress that was initially caused by this stressful event was highest for those who let themselves watch funny, something funny and let themselves laugh and be happy. The control group, the ones that watched nothing at all, they 
did not downregulate and those who watch something sad, they actually, their stress response got even worse. So how do we help ourselves have a more resilient landscape? Let yourself actually indulge in positive emotions. Let yourself savor your meal, find things to be grateful for, bring people together, yeah, bring people together into your into your life and induce positive emotions find things to um, laugh about watch funny movies give yourself the permission to use positive emotions to down regulate your nervous system that is what pleasure is there for really savor the smell of something delicious <laughs> thank you coronavirus for making me lose my sense of smell for two weeks and enabling me to really appreciate how it, it was very interesting because normally when you can't smell something it's because your nose is stuffy but when your nose isn't stuffy and you just go to smell something and you're like well it's good i can't smell myself i don't even need to wash my clothing for a couple of days because it smells fine to me it was very funny it actually took me a couple of days to realize that i lost my sense of smell and so it was quite laughable but now be having had lost my sense of smell i'm really allowing myself to just enjoy it and 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 bask in and luxuriate in the feelings that positive emotions bring that is one of the wisdoms of positive psychology and what it's telling us then haven yourself use self-touch if you are under quarantine with other people haven each other i'm going to give you these three havening movements uh the three the three or four movements of havening touch and one of the keys about it is not just that it's touch that is very loving one of my tantra teachers calls it love butter she says imagine that as you touch someone touch yourself the way you would touch a child very lovingly and so she used to say love butter love butter love butter so sometimes when i'm havening myself or I'm, if i'm petting someone or if i'm massaging someone i imagine i'm just painting their body with love butter okay so here's some of the different techniques so the first one i'm giving you is across the forehead so you go from your temple to so if your forehead to your temple forehead to temple and part of what we're looking for is loving touch, really allowing this to feel really soothing and imagining that you are doing this in a very specific rhythm, right? It's not really fast, like you're washing something. And it's not so, 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 so slow. It's like one, two, three, one, two, three, inhale, exhale, inhale. So it's a very specific, it's a, it's a soothing touch. We're trying to get, according to the people who created Havening, we're trying to get that delta uh, that delta wave, that soothing wave inside of your brain. And there's a gland that's right behind uh, our, our third eye center. If you go up from the roof of your mouth and in through the center of your forehead, you would actually T right into a spot in the middle of your head where your pineal gland is located. This is where we release melatonin. Melatonin is um, uh, connected to things like tryptophan and, and serotonin. And so it's just very good. That's why sometimes when we're stressed out, we put our hands here. We're actually trying to self-soothe ourselves by bringing that self-touch. So you can haven across your forehead. You can also go right across your face. We call this one face washing. Obviously, in a time of corona, you want to make sure you wash your hands before you touch your face. I unfortunately didn't do that, but it's okay. I'll wash my face and hands afterwards. So when you go across the cheeks with the palms of your hands or just across your cheek, again, this is just very soothing. Usually it feels really good. The more stressed you are, the quicker you'll see yourself actually drop. And it's a great idea to actually do a SUD, as we call it in, in uh, different energy uh, modalities. It's great to give yourself a SUD evaluation first. And a SUD evaluation is when you ask yourself a question of the subjective, subjective unit of distress and we call them suds. And so you ask yourself on a scale of zero to 10, how stressed out right now am I? How angry am I? And then haven yourself or tap yourself and watch it melt away. Or think about it, even just putting your fingers here. I teach this to school teachers to teach it to kids all the time. If you put your hands and just rest your three fingers into what Brain Gym calls your brain buttons and you try to hold a worry thought or you try to hold a stressful thought, you will find that the thought just melts away. It just melts away. It's very hard to hold a stressful thought and have your hands on your brain buttons at the same time. And that's because of the physiological bringing energy to the front of our brain, taking energy away from our amygdala. You can control your own physiology. 
there's lots of videos and a lot of havening practitioners have been putting together videos where you can actually follow along to affirmational havening as well um, that uh, that combines breathing and visualization and counting and you can even uh, use this you can use it to down regulate the nervous system but you can also use it to put in positive affirmations so that's the first havening touch move across the forehead the second is across your eyes across your cheeks then you go shoulders to elbows when you cross your hands across the midline of your body you're going shoulder to elbow shoulder to elbow shoulder to elbow so it's this downward movement that makes it really soothing feel free to try it with me it's shoulder to elbow shoulder to elbow it's not up and down vigorously like you're cold trying to warm up it's down 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 good quick story when i was in the mandalay bay hotel and we were on lockdown the parents there's a parents with two kids right behind me and one of the kids literally got so petrified he actually threw up from fear. And his mom wasn't being very helpful because literally the kid said, mom, I'm scared. And she said, me too, honey. I too, I know me too. And I was like, dude, you're the mom. You're not supposed to say that. You know, kid says I'm scared. Mama's going to go. It's okay, honey. Everything's going to be fine. And, and he was like hyperventilating and kind of was like gagging on his own puke. And she was rubbing his back vigorously, just trying to calm him down. And I said, here, here, let me help you. I'm a professional. I, I actually work with stress. Do this instead. And I just said, stroke the side of his arms like this. And I just taught her what to do. And he instantaneously calmed down. He stopped hyperventilating. And guess what? When she was havening him, she was getting havened, right? When, I, when my father was laying there and he was gasping for breath, I finally was able to get him an oxygen tank on Saturday night. Um, it, it wasn't an oxygen tank. I got him an oxygen concentrator, but it helped a little bit because he was getting more air. I, was, he, I just was petting his face. I was petting his shoulders. I was rubbing his arms. It was to calm him down, but I was havening myself at the same time. I knew I needed it as much as he did. And then the last one is across the palms. So it's wrist to fingertip, wrist to fingertip, wrist to fingertip. And what's great about this one, firstly, most people do it themselves naturally. If you're watching a lot of these news reports before anchors go on, you'll with everything that they're going through reporting coronavirus, you'll see they're usually rubbing their palms together. Kids will usually self rock. This is just us self soothing our body, but you can be self soothing just through your palms. And that's why when I was giving you guys a little bit of my um, trauma stories from earlier in my life, I was telling some of you rub your palms together so you can not get vicarious trauma from my experiences because I'm not traumatized by them. So you don't get to be traumatized by them if I'm not traumatized by them. I teach this to business people all the time and to students because you could be in a stress, you could be in a stressful business meeting or on a zoom and somebody could be triggering the fuck out of you. Sorry, I curse friends. I'm from New York. I'm allowed. And someone could be triggering you and guess what you're havening and they don't even know it right now. I'm havening myself. Y'all don't even know it. Um, because this is a really simple one. Although uh, some people have a preference for one of the modalities, giving them more touch, more, more calm. Um, others, EFT and tapping work incredibly well as well. Um, I'm not yet trained in EFT, but I'm looking forward to going through training in the next couple of months because I, I use it, I, I do it, it works. And I'm like, okay, time to get certified in it because that's what I do. I'm a certification junkie. Um, so EFT, there's tons of resources online. There's books, there's research studies, but basically you tap when you are identifying an, a thought, an emotion, a memory that's a trigger in the same way you would haven to calm the response. You can actually trick the brain by just using your two fingers to tap the points in a very specific way. And there's a, you can find videos online that will show you how to go through the sequence, but usually you can start off with your hands. Then you tap the different points in a very specific way. I'm going through them quickly, but you see them up on the screen. And then as you do that, you just keep repeating the sequence and it just melts away whatever I'm stressed about or whatever the experience is. And again, 
this is not just for untraumatizing ourselves. It could be also for putting positive affirmations in. So one of the things I know a lot of people are struggling with during this time of Corona is how to stay focused, how to stay organized, right? There's just, there's more demands on our attention. You're homeschooling, you're trying to work, you've got all these courses that you now need to do online because everyone and their mother is learning how to play piano and another language and all these other things that people are trying to do online right now. And so you can say, I am focused, I am focused, even though there's a lot of things that are pressing on my time right now, I can focus my energy. You can put affirmations in. There's a lot of research behind EFT, proving its effectiveness. And part of what it is probably doing, we still don't know, but we know it's definitely getting those electrical impulses going. We know it's tricking the brain. We know we're getting energy away from that emotional core brain into the rational thinking brain. Really, really powerful. Try it out. Lots of different modalities. The great thing about lots of different modalities is that we are able to get ourselves, find out what works for you. You don't even have to do all of them. You might really love havening. This might be enough for you. I know some people, havening doesn't do it for them, but EFT gets them every time. And again, we still don't know what's happening, but we do. Uh, the people who created Havening are suggesting that those AMPA receptors are being metabolized, that we're actually changing the landscape of the brain that is causing them to shrink and pop back in. And, or it is just neuroplasticity where we are just rewiring it. But when I use this modality, it, I've noticed with every single person that I've worked with that when we haven a memory, when we haven a strong emotion, they're not able to cultivate that strong emotional response for the same memory ever again. And the way that I describe it is it takes the claws out of the memory. I, you, can, you can repeat it clear as day. I was, um, when I was in the Mandalay Bay Hotel, I was there with my best friend we were both going through the same exact experience together at the same time. I have a slightly more resilient landscape because of my training, but she's a fairly incredibly resilient person as well. She's lost her mother also to ovarian cancer. She's incredibly resilient. She does really well. She's, you know, we both got on the other side of it. Obviously we went through this thing together, but it's interesting because we do reflect upon this often. She is still slightly traumatized by what happened in Mandalay Bay Hotel. And she knows that because when she hears Michael Jackson music, it actually makes her heart race a little bit more. And that's because, talk about things that got paired together. We were in, uh, we were in, um, uh, hold on just one second. Oh, I forgot, I've got it down. Okay. We were in, um, in when, when they first uh, shut down the theater, they didn't turn off the music for the performance. And so there was these like, like the songs and the background music of Michael Jackson looped for like three or four hours. And then they finally turned it off. And so when she hears Michael Jackson music, her brain takes her back to that place where I'm just like, it could just as well be Janet Jackson or Michael Jackson. I don't know. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't charge up my nervous system the way that it does hers. And, and so I, you know, I keep saying to her, I'm like, we should probably haven Michael Jackson music or at least tap it away in your brain, but it doesn't bother her that much, right? She's not, she's resilient. She didn't get PTSD as a result of it, but there's something about that experience that was traumatic. And this is what's important is that we're gonna be resilient, but we wanna make sure that we're resilient and untraumatized or the positive equivalent in control of what our brain is coding. Okay, we're almost there friends, <sighs> getting to our summary. Not yet, not to our summary. We're getting to our end. I just want to talk to you about the vagus nerve. Hang in there. We're almost there. You guys are amazing. 